Me and Mornings, we were new acquaintances. Uh, growing up, it was very much so a forced thing. Um, and anything forced, even if it's great, you don't like it. Dad's always been known for like being up before the sun and going out and starting things. And now I'm doing it, but I'm doing it very, very much so in my own way. Whereas he's like, roll out of bed, like running. I'm more of like, roll out of bed, take that time to kind of like set my intentions for the day, begin a new, plan it out. So now like in my later 20s, I now choose to wake up when the sun rises and to be kind of a part of the beginning of the day, uh, especially now that I live back on Shootout Lane after being gone for four or five years. We take a walk, we find a spot, I sit down, I really organize my thoughts for the day. And then once that's done, I eat breakfast and it's time to begin training. Kind of like the old man's been telling him for all these years, child, you better get up and see that sun. There's nothing more important than seeing the sunrise. And she's starting to take advantage of that, and her whole lifestyle is changing. Her training, her logbook, uh, everything now is in a system, and she's up early and competing and training, and it's just like the old man. <laughs> Get some. My father has taken the time to show me literally everything that he knows how to do. So it's an amazing, amazing blessing, not only in shooting, but in day-to-day -day life and how to function as a human. I truly wish that everyone could have the same shared learning experience that me and my father get to have together. His level of curiosity and questioning. He has more questions than like a five-year-old. Uh, so I've adopted that. My dad and I very much so clash, yet complement each other in a lot of different ways. But we both bring an open-mindedness and an eager and willing spirit to try everything. So we feed off of each other and we always build each other up in some way. With having Lena back on the range, my training routine has picked up a little bit. She's a lot younger, she's a lot quicker, so I like shooting with her. She's got a different mindset and her ability to execute well. I think I'm going fast, but really on the clock it's not. And I'm looking at her running and well, she's, she's 24 and I'm 65, so <laughs> it's a lot of fun to chase her. My driving force as I get older is the uh, total lack of knowledge that I have. <laughs> Even though I've competed and trained for 40 something years, there's always something new. So I want to go out on a range and learn something new every day. The perception of knowledge is not going to win, it's the application. So I'm always looking to apply to the next level. I think. I am addicted to understanding processes. And it's with that and kind of everything in my life, because with enough time and commitment comes understanding. And then once you understand a process, you can achieve anything. I tell people I'm not a gun nerd, I'm a technique nerd, because no matter what it is that I do, Understanding the process to achieve the goal that I want fascinates me to no end. Are you ready? Stand by. Good. One thing I like to do with Lena on the range before we leave is keep her, keep her interest up and keep her on her toes and make it a surprise. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Ah, there you have it. <laughs> Headshot. Make it happen. Come on. Loser picks up the brass. Come on. Come on. I see how it is. I see how it's going to be. It's never over. <laughs> ah. Oh, 
Oh, nice warm up. Headshots only. Headshots, headshots only? only? Come on. Yeah, a warm up. Let's make it happen. Yours wasn't a headshot on purpose. Yes, it was. But mine will be. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. I guess I gotta do the brass. You know okay. what to do. All right, you fair square. <laughs> Training is truly never over. Like you think you're done? Just kidding. Uh, you think you got the last shot in? Nope. You wanna go home? Doesn't matter. <laughs> We're doing more. Get some too. The Mitchell Legacy is being brought to you by Hoppies, the gun care people since 1903, and Hornady. By the time I was in my late 30s, I had already been a pro shooter with Smith & Wesson and I had won I don't know how many national titles. And then Lena came along and changed everything. <laughs> you know, having a child with you, it's really stressful because you have to train, you have to travel, and the wife is also training and she's traveling. So you have this child with you that needs attention 100% of the time. So you have to homeschool, you have to do everything yourself. Uh, it's just an adventure and it was, it was a lot of fun. Not only did I grow up in Louisiana, but I grew up homeschooled on 150 acres by two professional competitive shooters. Uh, I refer to it as me being a feral child. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I remember just like refusing to wear shoes. Uh, running through the woods, building forts, chopping down trees, picking up a lot of brass. Easter was ruined for me because my parents used to say that it was like Easter egg hunt, picking up the brass. <sighs> Don't ever tell your child that. Truly, like, it ruined that holiday for me. So I traveled pretty much with my parents uh, everywhere and I did not compete. I might have shot my first competition at eight, but I only knew the reality of shooting. Whereas most people come into shooting as a hobby or as a pastime. It was both of my parents extremely serious, remarkably time consuming job. So when people go, you know, oh, did you shoot growing up? Did you want to shoot? Uh, no, I did not. I did not want to shoot. I wanted nothing to do with it. Um, so I went to work, which was all around the US and the world, with my parents. Was it fun? Yes. Did we have fun? Yes. Did I spend an astronomical amount of time playing in the dirt at ranges all around the entire United States and world? Yes. <laughs> you know, when we started traveling with Lena when she was young, maybe five or six years old, we'd get people saying, hey, other competitors, is Lena shooting yet? Does Lena want to shoot? Are you, what are you, how are you training Lena? And the first thing I, well, I would say, and then Skate would say the same thing also, would be if she wanted to shoot, she's welcome to shoot. Uh, you don't have to follow what we do. There's no mandates on anything. If you want to do it and have fun with it like we do, it's available. I think a big misunderstanding is that like we lived on a range, so like on the weekends we go, no, it was the weekend. We were at competitions. My, my, well, my parents were at competitions. I was there wishing I kind of wasn't there. And then on weekdays, I wasn't gonna go and do my parents' job. So I never shot. We just made it work. Uh, there's a lot of like, I think glamor that goes into this lifestyle, but growing up in it, I only ever knew the reality of it. And the reality of it is that it's a hard job. Like, the level of commitment that they both put into it is 
astounding. I've kind of rushed on that, lady. I know. I've yet to make a super great cheek weld that I've been yeah, happy with. Yeah. Um, and I'm seeing that I'm So my shooting career started at a match called the Sportsman's Team Challenge, or STC. And it was a three-person team, uh, which is the most amazing thing to get someone that wasn't interested in shooting into shooting. Because it was like, hey, do you want to hang out with two other people? And then like go on a road trip with two other people your same age and like have a fun time. And it was like, yeah, of course. When Lena started competing Sportsman Team Challenge, of course, Kay and I were right there. And it, uh, she got coaching if she wanted it or not. <laughs> But she put a lot of her own style into it very early. So her eyes were open and she was already starting to adapt herself to the game. So in my first year, I went from shooting my first three gun in March to by the end of 2012, shooting 22 major matches, winning my first world title. So when I was 17, uh, that's when I guess I switched to becoming a professional. And for me, being a professional competitive shooter doesn't mean that I just have a cool jersey or I do it a whole lot. It's that it was the source of the income that sustained my life and my career of shooting. She actually had the ability to see that shooting might be a future and it's fun and she can follow with us. And I think that's when all the wheels came together and they started rolling. When I finally started winning things, don't really remember there being a giant change in how I felt. Because the hunger that drives you to be great never leaves. So anybody that's truly great at something is a little bit insane. You don't get there because you reach a point you're satisfied, it's because you're constantly not. Constantly. So, Dad's childhood was in southern Louisiana, in the true swamps, with the alligators and the snapping turtles and the nutri rats and the moss and the trees. Uh, it's a beautiful place. So he grew up there running around probably like a feral child in the woods. <laughs> Just causing all sorts of mayhem. But me, I grew up in northern Louisiana, which is much more dry. We don't have the swamps. I don't I didn't have all the alligators and the moss and the nutrient rats. We don't even have a one. I've been looking for a nutrient rat for a long time. The older I get, what I realize is what you own will own you. So we've got 150 acres here, and it owns a lot of my spare time. But I'm, I'm that kind of guy that has to do something all the time, and there's always something to do here. There's a lot of, I don't know, like fantasies that people have about growing up on a range. And yes, super awesome. But also know that from like birth to 16 years old, I didn't actually shoot on it but very, very occasionally. So it wasn't that cool because you know what I did get to do on it? Uh, haul trash, weed eat, pull staples, dig ditches, dig trenches, uh, haul steel, set up stages, pick up brass. Uh, of course, cutting grass is constant. You have maintenance on the equipment, plus the automobiles. And a giant list of more. Being a competitive shooter, it has like a really simple equation. Um, shoot to get better, to do your job, to make money, to buy more ammo, to shoot. It's just like a big loop, just as fast as we can. Um, and that's how you get where we are. Uh, so the more ammo you have, the more you can shoot, the better you can become, the more you can win, the more you can make to buy more ammo. <laughs> Well, when I started shooting, I've, I've footed my own way for 15, 20 years. So when I saw a piece of brass laying on the ground that I could use, I was gonna pick it up. Always looking for tire weights, or scrap lead of any kind that we can make bullets out of. What you find if you start to be a competitive shooter or you're a, sh you're a shooting enthusiast is the cost aspect of it. It doesn't take long to shoot a thousand rounds. So if you buy a thousand factory bullets, eh, 
cost goes really up. So that's when we started investing into bullet casting equipment, uh, lead pots, uh, molds, all the other lubricizers, and uh, you can shoot a lot really cheap. The lead runs deep in these veins, whether we want it to or not. Dad definitely taught me how to cast bullets. When you cast bullets, it's like, I don't know, adding in like a missing link to reloading that really completes the whole cycle, you know, of like getting around, shooting it, then like, I don't know, like harvesting the lead again, picking up the brass, cleaning the brass, preparing it, melting down this like giant nasty pile of lead, cleaning it, purifying it, creating something new again, and then like bringing them together, building it uh, in any configuration that you want to like how much powder, what kind of powder, what type of primer, what's your goal for it. It's kind of like a creative puzzle. Being as efficient with your ammo as possible. So reloading brass, reusing it until it's literally like cracked down the sides. No brass forgotten on this range. We will find, we will search, we will rescue each one. It will be reloaded. Uh, lead, shoot it into a bullet trap instead of into the berm. Then you can take it, you can melt it back down, you can cast it into more bullets. You can reload into that brass that you already used that you can make more ammo and then you can do the process again. One thing I wanted to impart into Lena is the ability for her to make her own projectiles and lubricate them and load them and then go out and train with them in her carry gun. And that's something she's gonna have with her. My philosophy behind concealed carry is that there is no right answer. Self-defense is self-defense. The less you have to work with, the more tools you need in your toolbox to achieve the same thing. It's about you valuing your life and your safety and taking steps that you're comfortable with. Tell people if that means a gun, a knife, a flashlight, a rock and a sock, I don't care. I just want you to care about you. The most important thing when it comes to concealed carry isn't finding the perfect gun or the perfect gear, or getting the right training. All these things are really important. But the thing is you have to have your reason why. Okay, yes, yes, you have the right. Cool, fantastic. I also have the right to do a lot of things and I have the ability to do a lot of things that I don't do on the daily basis. I refuse to let someone stand in danger's way for me if I have the ability and the capability of protecting and stepping up to the responsibility of my own personal protection. Remember, yep. I got a senior discount. You're taking my bullets? They're mine. No, you're not taking Winner my bullets. No, no, you're not taking them. No, no. I don't want to take them. When I first started shooting, I think the NRA publication had a picture of Ed McGivern on the cover. I think it was 1975 or something along that, 73. And he was doing all this wonderful fast shooting with a double action revolver. And I kind of, in the back of my brain, said, I want to be like Ed McGivern. So 45 years later, I'm shooting like Edward Gibbard. <laughs> I think in the spirit of being a Michelic, being addicted to the difficult, uh, to also do something that people don't think is possible. Like for him, he's achieved more things. Things that I honestly don't think anyone will ever touch because everyone else in the world isn't as crazy and they look at Revolver and they go, what? <laughs> Why in the world would I choose that? Like I can't even shoot a 2011, a 1911, anything that fast. How am I gonna do that with a Revolver? And he looked at it and he was just like, well, gotta figure it out. And he truly figured it out with no support, no prior education, there was not competitive shooting. That was not even a thing. They were not professional shooters. Ah, he did it all just through straight up rounds down range, hours, endless curiosity, endless questioning, and never assuming that he knew anything. It took me all the way until 2011, being 15, 16 years old, 
for me to like pick up a revolver and ever really try it at all. It was just not even a thing. Uh, and I was like, whoa, this feels right. <laughs> what I loved about revolver was how complicated it was to do the same thing that everyone else was doing with ease, which kind of sounds weird, but I guess it calls back to kind of my obsession with the process and perfecting a process. One of the first places anyone looks when they get into shooting for like improvement, I feel like is gear. You know, like a better holster, a better trigger, a different gun. But all of our gear is remarkably simple and we always look to ourselves. I think dad really proved that with making revolver speed shooting, the most like oil and water combination I've ever heard of, uh, his thing. He proved that it wasn't the gear, it was the shooter behind the gear. It was the technique, the mindset, the dedication uh, in how you apply yourself to the firearm. I started shooting revolver because it was a lot of fun. And of course now PCC is a, is a really hot and popular division to shoot. And Lena took to specializing in it. Then in 2019, I was like, you know what? Maybe I try this super wild idea where I shoot one gun. And I did. And I chose pistol caliber carbine or PCC uh, because it's so fast. Stand by. When I first started shooting PCC, I had a lot of interest in it. But when Lena started training, she would come out and do these super runs, and I'm standing there going like, hey, I want to play too, you know, so I got to step my game up. So we started training together, and she brought in a lot of fresh ideas on how to move and how to handle the guns that I wasn't using in three gun, because the formats are similar, but they're so speed oriented. Uh, the way you hold and how you run is totally different. And uh, she helped me a lot on that. Dad and I, it doesn't really matter what we're shooting. You know, him with revolver, me with PCC, or me going and shooting revolver with him. Like, there's always something to be learned. If you're walking away from shooting and not having learned something, it's not because of what you were practicing, it's not because of what you were shooting, it's because of the mindset that you approached it with. So there's no training or really any round sound range that aren't beneficial. World records are truly wet set my father apart, especially in the beginning of his career. Like, world records are really that, like, hardcore left field, like, super random, commit your life to thing that pretty much no one did. And I also knew no one that said as many as him. Uh, and if they did, they weren't in speed. They weren't, like, it's just, like, it was just a thing he did. So a world record is something that you want to chase and you want to try to do your best at and you train hard for it, then the moment comes and you apply yourself to the problem, then I want to do something else. It's just, a, it's just another level. I want to be hungry. I want to run after the football and not with it. So if you ask me how many nationals I've won, I really don't know. I'd rather do the speed performance. Just having fun and just letting it fly. It wasn't for me, what can I say? Whereas world uh, titles, are more of like the shooting Olympics because all of the action shooting sports are not allowed in the Olympics because we're considered too extreme. Pretty much we have too much fun. We get to go and represent the United States on the world stage, wherever that may be. For me, I've gotten to compete in Hungary, Italy, France, Russia, um, a few other places, and hopefully my next one will be in Thailand. It's a lot of, a lot of weight on those competitions. Um, and a lot of pride to be able to go uh, and represent our country. Whereas my father had Ed McGivern kind of as his like bar of greatness to achieve. Um, I did not. I didn't have anything, or really any one specific one. I wanted it to be my career. So I needed to figure out how to make that happen to add competitions, I wanted to beat myself. And that's still the mindset that I operate with. Um, if I can beat myself, I'll be untouchable. 
Uh, and the thing is, like, even if I beat myself and I don't win, I'm still untouchable. I don't know, it's a really, it's, it's a mindset. As things stand now, I have eight world titles in five different shooting disciplines. Shotgun, rifle, PCC, three gun, and then the NRA World's Greatest Shooter, which was a match that had 12 different shooting disciplines within one competition. The very first world title that I ever won was in 2012 in Hungary. Then we went to Italy for the second IPSC shotgun world shoot where I was showing up to defend my world title, the first world title, like my first baby. Like I had to defend my first baby. Um, and I was able to do that there. And then I won the ladies shoot off again in women's standard division. Then in France was the third IPSC shotgun world shoot where I was able to defend my title for a second time. Uh, individual team, the ladies team defended that and the shoot off, uh, obviously, you can see a theme. I like shotgun. Um, <laughs> Russia was something else, I'll tell you that. That was the last time I got to compete uh, on a team with my mom. So me and my mom both got to go and like side by side in the ladies open team, along with my best friend, Ashley, and another wonderful lady, Maggie Reese, got to go and represent the US together. And it was just like, mmm. That was a win. Standing there with the flag, looking down with my dad in like his USA jersey, like looking up and we're all singing the anthem. It was really good. Mm -hmm. This doesn't get much better than that, you know? It's all the years of training together and uh, working together as a, as a father, daughter, and uh, coaching whether she needs it or not. <laughs> It was just, an, it was really a good moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very I guess you I got that one. On that one. I don't think that was really behind your back. I think it counted. Huh? I think it counted. No. I started shooting three gun back in the 80s. Uh, it was called Soldier Fortune. They had, to, they had a $10,000 prize, but I wanted to compete for it. So I've been doing it a long time. Lita started off in three gun when she was very young and was actually very good at it. Her long gun ability has always been amazing. But uh, the idea of three gun competition to me is you go rifle by handgun, which you have to really trigger, 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 because it's everything, and you pick up a shotgun, which you really don't have to worry about a trigger, you can slap it. So the trigger techniques and the shooting techniques and the stances constantly change, and it keeps you on your game, and you have to pay attention for everything you're doing, and it makes for a really fun day. And that's how I fell in love with Three Gun. I showed up completely unprepared uh, and then became remarkably overwhelmed and went, this is pretty cool. Uh, I'm gonna do more of this. One thing about Lena and I being pro shooters, we're very competitive. I don't care if you're out practicing. If I'm even cutting my yard, I'm timing myself how fast I can cut the yard with my, with my mower. So it's like uh, always competitive. So when Lena and I get on the range, we we'll always try to one up each other. First off, I'm the least vicious and competitive one out of the Mitchellick family. Let's just put that out there. But it is still what all of us do for a living. <laughs> so you cannot spend um, literally all of your time and mental and physical efforts trying to be the best at something and the competitiveness not leak over into everything that you do. Social media is a really big part of like being a professional competitive shooter. It's my love and my passion and I want to make the range and shooting and firearms a like fun, acceptable and exciting place for everyone to come. So our social challenges started between dad and I when I went out just to like film a video and I had no idea what I was gonna do and I was like, oh, I'll shoot my shotgun one armed. He's like, oh well, I've done it before, why not? And I did that and I like shot it just fast, normal. And like, I don't know, I was just being me, doing things. You know, I was looking at one of Lena's 
social media post, and there she was shooting a JM Mossberg shotgun. That's, that stands for Jerry Mitchellite. And she's all proud of us, whatever she did. So I had to go back and do one better. And that kind of went on, and it's, it's escalating. So he gets out there, and he makes his challenge. And like, mocks me, mocks me in my joyous happiness that I love and the world loves. So then, obviously, I had to do it. And then, let's continue. <laughs> I played a little dirty on the last one and I utilized my my physical strengths that I know he doesn't have. So we'll see. We'll see what it comes up with next. Shotgun was my first love in the shooting sports. And it's, people always look at me weird when I tell them why. And it's because it's the most violent. So say you suck with a pistol, you miss. You're slow. Suck with a rifle, you miss. You're slow. You suck with a shotgun, you miss. You're slow. And you get beat up. Pain is such a good teacher and it motivates everyone more than anything. Obviously, I went to all of my first competitions, my first multiple years with both my mom and my dad. Okay, well, they're both shooting gods. I'm rolling in, new shooter and they would come up with these stage plans that were the most efficient way to shoot it. Yes, but the joy of three gun, a lot of times is that you get to play to your own strengths. So they, being pistol wizards, would show up and be like, I'm gonna take half this stage with pistol and only shoot two shots with my shotgun because it makes the most sense. And yes, it did if you were a pistol wizard. I was not. So Three Gun is an amazing place to go and be able to apply your own skills. Shotgun was my greatest strength when I began. So I had to learn to be comfortable with doing what was considered not the best plan, but the best plan for me, utilizing my strengths. Well, when Lena started training for Three Gun, uh, it was the same thing with everybody. The handgun is always going to be the separator on a, at a three-gun match. So that's where you want to put your time into. And when you get to the shotgun, shotguns now are how fast you can load them, not necessarily how fast you can shoot them. Uh, rifle, then again, uh, there's a lot of trigger, there's a lot of vision technique that's going to change. So it's, uh, it's a lot of application, constant application. Dad and I are definitely training partners. Uh, obviously, when I started out, I was a student, and he was my coach, and he was my mentor, and all of that. But now we're both to a level of understanding, and we both very much so learn and talk in the same manner. Five. 22.68. Nicely done. You really were afraid you weren't going to be able to get I me, was. weren't they? You shot that <laughs> like you were mad. <laughs> so we get like, uh, we're training buddies on the range. No one better than the other. So we see each, what we're doing and we talk about it and then we try to make it up to the next level, to the next level. And uh, I'm just trying to stay up with her. <laughs> the only thing that makes uh, teaching more fun, like about anything else in life, is doing it with someone else. Uh, so being able to teach not just with anyone but with dad, like the guy that taught me and who I train with now and who we're constantly just like sharpening each other's skills to go and then bring that dynamic um, to a class setting is amazing. Uh, I love it. We have so much fun. Probably the main reason that I do classes with Lita is have time with her on, her, on the range. I kind of bring back memories when she was young and we shot together. And what's really good about this, I come in with like, you know, 45 years with her burning lead on the range and later also is probably 20 years now. And uh, her shooting style is different. So when we do our coaching and uh, I'm working with a student and maybe I can't get through something visually and she can step up and maybe give it to him in a, in a different perspective. We offer the same thing, but in such a different package that it makes I think everyone walk away with something. 
The first thing we start off with is letting everyone know that there is no one right way to do anything. And that although they have come to learn from us, they have to question everything that we tell them and we encourage them to question it. We even tell them to like try what we say and then try the opposite and then try everything in between. Our goal is never to make like little cookie cutter Jerry's and cookie cutter Lena's. Because the thing is when you just force everyone into one specific mold, um, it doesn't highlight any of their strengths. When they walk away, they'll never be able to truly make it better. For me, what I would tell any new shooter is it's not about good, bad, ugly, winning, losing, whatever titles you want to put on it. It's about understanding how you get every single result. Result is your hit or miss on target. After every single drill you shoot, you should ask yourself these four questions. One, what did I see? Your eyeballs are open. You see everything. What did I feel? You're alive. Everything from your toes to your nose to the top of your head to your fingertips, it's feeling something. Three, what were your results? Only then do you get to look at your target. And then fourth, what am I gonna do next? Because we're not done. We're never done. And this process was created by how dad and I train and how we train together. Because what I discovered was after every single string of fire, I had this ear man with a mustache that wanted to know what I saw. I had mom and dad. I had two of the best shooters in the entire world to be my instructors. My dad arguably has the best technique for shooting a pistol known on this planet. So when I grew up, guess what I did? I stood like my dad, I held my gun like my dad, I did everything like him. Uh, makes sense, why would you do anything different? So we're working and we're shooting, I'm holding my gun, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And he's yelling at me, hold my gun tighter. Hold my gun as tight as I can, and I go one, two, three, four, five, six. You stop noodling it. You're noodling the gun, you're breaking your wrist. And I'm like, I'm holding it. And we bickered, and we bickered. And then I broke out a tape measure, and I measured his forearms, and I measured my calves, and they were the same size. And I thought, Oh, how can I apply a technique, even though it is the best in the entire world, to this and expect and want a better result? Because I don't want to just be as good as him. I want to be better than him. I just had to realize and not say that I had less to work with, but understand that I had different strengths to work with and figure out what they were specifically and how to highlight them. Yeah. Once again, he's an amazing shooter and will never ever doubt his technique, but it's not for me. And what I do isn't for everyone. What I do isn't for him, but you gotta question it all and you gotta try it all. You can always walk away from something with training. It doesn't matter if you're shooting, if you're watching someone shoot, if you're the instructor, if you're the student, always something to learn. Get some too. The Mitchell Legacy is being brought to you by Hoppies, the gun care people since 1903, and Hornady. What I want people to remember with the name Mitchell is not necessarily the championship you won or the records you've set, but your ability to share with others and get new people into the sport. Uh, three or four years from now, that championship is long gone and dead. But you being a nice guy and sharing with other people is what's going to keep your name in the front. As a Mitchellick and as a professional shooter, um, obviously I am following in the footsteps of my father. But I'm at a really fun point where I'm making my own. Forever thankful for everything that I've been taught not just in the shooting world, but in the mindset of questioning and discovering and searching for new and better ways to do everything. And in that, it made me, guess what? Want to find a new and better way to do everything in my life. That includes like how to live my life and how to structure it. Um, so I've definitely switched things up from the, from the OG Michalik way. <laughs> 
uh, to my own, and it's ever evolving, just like my shooting technique is. Lane and I both go for perfection. And in, in my occupation, you have, I want to be perfect, even though you, you can never obtain it. My aspect of perfection is uh, I'm just going to throw myself at it. I mean, just work, work, work. I don't know what, really what I'm doing, but I'm going to do a whole lot of it. Lena comes at her perfection in a different way. Her mental game is a lot better. She's, in the last five or six years, she had really perfected her technique of uh, where she wants to be mentally. I liked the fact that now I can kind of call myself like the handy woman of shooting. Like, hand me just about anything. Give me a bit of instruction and I can probably make it happen. So I've been shooting professionally now for 10 years. So what's next? Eight world titles, couple world records, got those, snagged those, put those in my toolbox. Uh, I think what's next for me is new things. Now I get to take that process to success and apply it to other stuff. So that looks like me saying yes to literally anything I haven't done before from snowboarding to ice climbing to skydiving to blacksmithing. Right now that's kind of what my goals are. Go everywhere, see it all, try it all, because why not? People always say that I'm the one that's carrying the legacy. If there's any part of it that I want it to be what I carry on, a dedication and a passion to pursue something that you don't know that you can do. To face daily like the fear of failure in pursuit of greatness. Like that's what my father did. He literally took a leap of faith from an established career that he was many, many, many years in that his father said, you'd be a fool if you left and went, but I love it. And he deep dove into it and he achieved heights of, that are untouchable still. Like that, whatever it may be in, whether it be in shooting or people just feeling that fire in their day-to-day -day life, like that's the legacy I wanna carry on. You know, guys, with all the uncertainty in the world right now, you really don't know what you're going to do next week, but I'll tell you what, I've got a lot of ammunition, got a lot of guns, and I've got Lena, and we're going to train together, and we're going to have some fun. Ready to go make some noise? Let's do it. I'm not a betting man, but I'm betting Lena is going to carry on the family name, and she's going to do it in her own way. The range will always be my home. Always.